We ended the last lecture looking at the Wilton Diptych, an international Gothic painting in England. The international Gothic style in Italy was a late descendant of the Italo-Byzantine style, and it retained its popularity well into the 15th century. A fine example of the style is Lorenzo Monaco's Coronation of the Virgin with Saints from 1407 to 1409. Lorenzo Monaco, who was active around 1399 till his death around 1423-24, was born Piero di Giovanni. He took the name Lorenzo, or Lawrence, on becoming a monk in 1391 at the monastery of Santa Maria degli Angeli in Florence. Monaco simply means monk. He later lived outside the monastery but continued to work for it, providing them with the altarpiece for the high altar of the monastery's church. The National Gallery's painting of the Coronation of the Virgin appears to have been made for the monastery of San Benedetto Fuori della Porta Pinti, also in Florence. Both monasteries, both the one Monaco had belonged to and this other monastery, were Camaldoli's institutions. That is, they belonged to a particularly ascetic branch of the Benedictine order. San Benedetto, was a new monastery only founded in 1400. A document associated with the monastery indicates that the altarpiece was commissioned by a Florentine layman, Luca Piero di Rinieri, or Ranieri, in 1407. The document stipulated that an inscription include references to Luca and his descendants on the painting. Traces of this inscription can still be made out on the tile dais in the foreground of the central space. However, the document didn't specify which saints should be uh, painted beyond the fact that they should be there. The monks of San Benedetto may have reserved to themselves the right to decide exactly what would be depicted. Such contracts for paintings were likely common at the time, but very few have survived till today. The painting was finished by 1409. The San Benedetto altarpiece today looks like a fixed triptych, that is, one without movable wings. In fact, what we are probably seeing instead are the main fragments from a polyptych, or many-part altarpiece. There might well have been paintings in pinnacles at the top of the now lost frame, while small paintings, including two others in the National Gallery, that narrate the life of San Benedetto would likely have been placed in a predella, that step at the bottom of the altarpiece. The primary subject of the coronation of the Virgin by her son was a very popular one in Florence. Other examples can be seen in the National Gallery. This is a non-biblical subject, that is, it does not occur anywhere in the Christian Bible, but reflected the high status of the Virgin Mary within Christianity in this era. The colors, the gold background, the variety of punch marks, and the use of sgraffito befit such a royal subject as Mary crowned the Queen of Heaven. They also reflect the conservative nature of Florentine art of the early 15th century. While Monaco did convey some of the sense of the bodies underneath the draperies and projects the throne into space, the lighting scheme is not consistent and the figures are really generalized types. The adoring saints in the two side scenes are ones associated with the Benedictine order or ones popular in Florence. St. Benedict himself is at the left in the first row with a white robe. Overall, it represents more continuity than change from the work of Duccio or Jacopo Diccioni, but is an absolutely gorgeous painting in its own right. How radically different, however, is a painting made by another Florentine artist, Masaccio, made some 18 years later. While the subject of Masaccio's virgin and child is conventional, its appearance ushers in a new approach to conceiving figures in space. The painter Tommaso di Giviani, uh, whose dates are 1401 to about 1428-29, called Masaccio, which simply means Big Bad Tom, had a short but important career. It is not far-fetched to say that he was the first painter of the Italian Renaissance style. He is best known for his frescoes, that is, wall paintings, in the Brancacci Chapel of Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence, but uh, his few panel paintings are equally significant. This painting, The Virgin Child, is also his most fully documented painting. The patron, Ser Giuliano di Colino degli Scarsi di San Giusto, 
commissioned the altarpiece for a church in the town of Pisa. He first paid Masaccio in February 1426 and finished his payments in December of that year. While the chapel of St. Julian in the church of Santa Maria del Carmine in Pisa no longer exists, this is where the painting used to be, the painting was identified as having been there by the writer Vasari in 1568. What we see today in London is a fragment of a larger polyptych. It appears to have been crowned with a crucifixion scene still in existence while depictions of saints surrounded it. The predella contains scenes from the lives of some of the most prominent saints shown above, such as Saints Julian, Nicholas, and Peter. Even today, scholars still debate the original configuration of the altarpiece, but it is impossible to know this with any certainty, given that major sections of it have never been found such as the saints that would have been to the virgin's right and left. The virgin and child itself was somewhat cropped at the sides, top, and bottom at some point in its history. Many parts of the painting are in poor condition with considerable paint loss on the surface. Note, for instance, the darkened area of the virgin's left hand or Christ's feet, which were both heavily restored in the past. Nonetheless, the painting makes a powerful impression, and it is such an important painting historically that it merits inclusion in the course despite these problems with condition. A comparison to Duccio's Virgin and Child is instructive. Nothing of Masaccio's technique differs from Duccio's. Note the symmetrical construction, gold background, rich blue robe of the Virgin, and use of punch marks. In that sense, it is still a conventional Florentine altarpiece. But a new concept of figural representation has emerged in Masaccio's art. Gone is the light refinement of Duccio's figures and their elegant, as well as unnaturalistic, elongation. Here the virgin child sits stolidly on the large stone throne that surrounds them. Their bodies, carefully lit from the left, suggest real volume and space. The angels who sit on the front step playing stringed instruments are carefully foreshortened. That is, they're represented at an extreme visual angle to indicate their position in space. The scene is composed using what is called linear perspective, which takes advantage of the fact that optically objects that are farther away seem to shrink and parallel lines converge in the distance. One reason that Masaccio's figures seem to tower over us is that the vanishing point here, that is the place where these parallel lines would be seen as converging, is set high. We have to look up to see the Virgin. That was a very conscious decision on Masaccio's part. One of the most telling details here is the depiction of Christ's halo. It too is shown foreshortened in an ellipse. Its shape and the shadow that Christ's hair casts on the halo's bottom both convince us of the spatial reality of Masaccio's world. The impressive figures here create a solemn mood. The Virgin Mary is utterly still and seems lost in contemplation of her son's difficult future. The Christ child now is a real baby with more convincing proportions and he is in scale with his mother. He reaches for grapes with his left hand while sucking on the fingers of his right hand. Now this seems like a very natural, childish thing to do, an entirely human gesture, but at the same time it would reference the wine of the Eucharist and portend his sacrifice in the crucifixion where his blood was spilt. Therefore, this would resonate with the laity when the priest raised the host in the performance of the Mass. Although only 25 when he painted this work, Masaccio was in full control of this new style. But how did this radical new approach develop? First of all, Masaccio was uh, among a group of pioneer artists who looked to art from classical antiquity. The large, heavily draped figure of the Virgin and the full-fleshed child have predecessors in Roman sculpture. He knew other important artists who also looked to ancient art, such as the Florentine sculptor Donatello, who accompanied Masaccio when he received one of the payments for the Virgin and Child, and who was also working in Pisa right around the same time. Brunelleschi, who was the most important Florentine architect of the time, was also inspired by the classical past. Here, the throne that the Virgin Child sits on resembles Brunelleschi's architecture. 
One of the ways in which it does so is the choice of depicting it as if it is made from Pietra Serena. This was a gray-toned sandstone used in Florence. Also, the use of the classical orders for the columns of the throne, a composite, Corinthian, and Ionic, would echo Brunelleschi's own practice. Even the decoration of the dais on which the throne rests resembles ancient Roman sarcophagus designs. And this, too, would also be a hint about the future of the child and his death. The interconnections among these Renaissance artists are further hinted at by the fact that Brunelleschi is often credited with having designed this system of linear perspective in painting. He was an art theorist as well as an architect. The revival of ancient pagan culture to celebrate Christianity in 15th century Italy is one of the hallmarks of the Italian Renaissance as a cultural movement. The epicenter of this movement was in Florence. The Renaissance also emphasized the role of the individual within society. Thus, innovation by independent artists such as Masaccio, Donatello, and Brunelleschi, and even competition uh, would become leitmotifs of Renaissance art. One intriguing detail of The Virgin and Child by Masaccio suggests the creative mind of the artist. Mary's halo is inscribed with punch marks, as was traditional, but it is also decorated with letters spelling out Ave Gratia Plena, that is, Hail, full of grace. This is in Latin. This is how the angel Gabriel greeted Mary during the Annunciation when she learned she would bear the Messiah. What is unusual here, though, is that Masaccio has formed the letters with a variant of the Kufic script, the earliest calligraphic form used in Islamic art to write out the holy word of the Quran. Now, Masaccio may not have known the precise relationship of form and word from another culture in this case, but he must have at least seen objects from Islamic cultures in Italy decorated with this script and thus associated it with foreign exotic lands, such as the Holy Land in the time of Jesus. Paolo di Dono, whose dates were about 1397 to 1475, who was called Paolo Uccello, bird, Uccello was said to have been fond of both keeping and depicting birds, uh, was a more idiosyncratic Florentine painter than Masaccio, one who delighted above all in using this new linear perspective system of spatial representation in creative and unusual ways. Indeed, Vasari claimed that when Uccello's wife would try to call him away from his work to come to bed at night, he would respond, oh, what a lovely thing this perspective is. His love of perspectival construction is plainly evident in the Battle of San Romano. This painting is one of a set of three by the artist of this battle, which had been won by the Florentines against the Sienese in 1432. At that point, Florence was at war with an alliance of cities led by Luca. These are all Tuscan cities. This war was really about trade and about access to Pisa's port. Florence's victorious general, Niccolò Moruzzi da Tolentino, instantly draws our eye in this painting with his position at its very center, riding a white horse and wearing a damask red and gold hat. All three paintings of the battle that are now in London, Paris, and Florence were once thought to have been made for the Medici family in Florence, which ruled the city from 1434 until their exile in 1494. A Medici palace inventory from 1492 describes paintings of the Battle of San Romano in that collection. In 2000, however, a document was discovered that indicated an entirely different line of patronage by the Bartolini Salambini family. Leonardo di Bartome Bartolomeo Salambini was the head of the Council of Ten in Florence, the leading council of rulers at that time before the Medici took over who directed the war when the Battle of San Romano was fought in 1432. It is now thought that he commissioned the paintings around 1438 at the time of his second marriage. After his death in 1479, his will was disputed by the sons of his first marriage, and a civil process of arbitration took place in 1483. Lorenzo de' Medici was part of the arbitration group, and it appears that sometime afterward, perhaps as soon as 1484, he had the painting seized and taken to the Medici Palace 
obviously not the person to invite onto your arbitration board. There it appears their format was changed from arch to rectangular. Additions to the top left and right can be plainly made out in the London painting when seen in person. These real world wars over ownership of these spectacular paintings seem a bit ironic when one considers the fairy tale atmosphere of the paintings themselves. In the London painting, the battle moves from left to right in the foreground. Horses rear and men fall, but in an entirely bloodless fashion. The armor must have been closely studied by Uccello from existing examples, since the pieces are accurately represented and can be dated to the decade 1430 to 1440. Yet he doesn't do it accurately in one sense. Not everyone is really dressed for battle. Da Tolentino, for instance, is missing several essential pieces he should be wearing, while other soldiers here wear tournament helmets with crests rather than actual war helmets. The men fight in front of a lush range of low trees and bushes from which roses, pomegranates, and oranges grow. In the far distance, archers ready themselves for battle, but the swiftly receding perspective scheme makes them seem impossibly far away. The effect of the whole is similar to battle tapestries, and this was a popular uh, luxury item for the very rich throughout Europe in the 15th century. These tapestries would have been even more expensive than paintings. Some of the sense of unreality found here reflects problems in preservation. Details of both men's faces and some of the horses' bodies have been lost over time, thus flattening their forms and making them look a little cartoon-like. People talk about these as sort of hobby horses rearing up. Silver leaf for helmets and some harnessing details have tarnished, removing a once glittering surface effect. Nonetheless, Uccello's gleeful creation of a world where everything obeys his perspective scheme, including lances, bits of armor, and even the fallen soldier who dies here uh, according to the laws of linear perspective, make this a compelling image and even charming in its very bloodlessness. It is also significant that paintings of this scale were made for a private residence in 15th century Florence. This reveals something of the wealth of the city at this time, as well as the widespread interest in the new Renaissance art style. The fact that the subject was now entirely secular suggests another important change in the world of art. We will now move to a time where it is not simply all about Christianity. Let us briefly look at one last work from Florence, Pesolino's Pistoia Santa Trinita altarpiece. While there are many fascinating aspects to this work, I would like to concentrate on its composition and its physical form. The painting was begun by Francesco di Stefano, whose dates were 1422 to 1457. His father and his grandfather were painters in Florence before him. Since he was raised by his grandfather called Pizzello, he received the nickname of Pezzolino, or the Little Pizzello. Although he's not as well known as the other painters we are looking at in this lecture, he was well respected in his day, and this work is usually considered his masterpiece. The painting was commissioned by the Compagnia della Trinità, the company of priests devoted to the Trinity, for their church in Pistoia in 1455. They set the subject, decided which saints they wanted shown with the Trinity. One company member actually campaigned successfully for St. Mamas, a rarely depicted early Christian martyr that we see over on the left. Pesolino worked on the painting in Florence until his early death in 1457. The patrons had two painters, Filippo Lippi and Domenico Veneziano, estimate how much work was left to be done. They described it as half-finished. Filippo Lippi and his workshop then took over the commission, which was finally finished in 1460. Scholars still debate about which parts were done by Lippi in his workshop and which were the products of Pesolino. It would have been Lippi's task to work in Pesolino's style to actually imitate that of the other master so that the altarpiece would have a consistent appearance. The form of this altarpiece is significantly different now from the others we've seen before. Instead of separate sections, everyone in the image is brought together in one unified field above the area of the predella. 
Saints from different eras are gathered together with the Trinity. Again, this is not a historical image, it's a timeless image. Pesolino's altarpiece is an important example of this new compositional approach that became standard by the later 15th century, the unified field. The tabernacle frame that we see here is a modern one, but was a common type for altarpieces of such unified fields. It is derived from ancient architectural precedents and is characterized by columns or, as here, pilasters on the side, again, those flat strips that we see, with a heavy entablature at top, that molding the three-part horizontal unit. Thus, the design of frames was as affected by the Renaissance revival of antiquity as was the style of the paintings and approach to the depiction of figures. Note, too, that we have moved away from the use of an abstract gold background. While the appearance of the Trinity is shown here to be a vision by the clouds that are underneath the crucifix and the mandorla, that is the almond-shaped form of angels surrounding God the Father, the saints stand in a naturalistic landscape. This makes the impressively solid male saints seem that much more real. St. Mamas, in particular, again foreground left, suggests that Pesolino too was aware of other contemporary artists. Donatello's David sculpture has been suggested as a model for this particular saint. We have looked at fragments from altarpieces in this course. What we see in the Trinity altarpiece is a work that once was cut into fragments but has been reassembled over time through the efforts of the National Gallery. Only the lower right-hand corner of the main scene is a reconstruction of a lost fragment, while a fifth predella scene survives in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Other than that, we have the whole altarpiece here. This painting may have been taken apart as uh, late as the 18th century, with the main scene cut into four, uh, five, or even six parts. These parts were painstakingly acquired by the National Gallery between 1863 and 1929. The piece that shows Saints Mamas and James is actually a loan from the British Royal Collection. It will likely remain at the National Gallery with the other pieces. The Predella scenes entered the collection in 1937. It was a very influential painting in its time and is still a beautiful now, but its history reminds us of the vicissitudes suffered by works of art over time and makes clear how important the job of the conservators is to reunite such panels so successfully. While Florence was certainly the most important artistic center in the 15th century for stylistic innovation, there were wonderful works created in other places. 15th century Sienese art was more conservative than Florentine art, often referencing the graceful style of Duccio and his followers. But still, even there, the effects of the new naturalism can be found in the best of its artists, such as the National Gallery's San Sepulcro altarpiece by Sassetta. Stefano di Giovanni, active from about 1427, died in 1450, called Sassetta for reasons we do not know, was a leading artist in Siena in the first half of the 15th century. His most important and fortunately uh, best documented work was the double-sided altarpiece made for the church of San Francesco in Borgo San Sepolcro from 1437 to 1444, celebrating St. Francis of Assisi whose uh, dates were 1181-82 to 1226. The scenes of St. Francis's life were originally on the back of the altar to either side of a depiction of St. Francis in glory. So again, a double-sided altar, paintings done for both sides of it. Unusual, but suggests how important this altarpiece was, as well as the fact it was freestanding in a place where people could come from both sides. What we are seeing with St. Francis meets a knight poorer than himself, and St. Francis's vision of the founding of the Franciscan order is bringing together two different parts of the narrative, two scenes into one unit, showing successive early moments in the narrative of the saint's life. At the left, the wealthy young saint gives his cloak to an impoverished knight who is silhouetted against a castle in the background. At right, St. Francis has a dream vision of a castle in the sky. 
White banners with red crosses, symbols of the resurrected Christ, appear at the castle's corners. This dream was said to prefigure the saint's founding of the Franciscan order. The figure style here reflects the refined, elegant figures of Duccio. St. Francis and the knight seem to almost float against the landscape background, which recedes abruptly into the distance. So even though we've replaced gold leaf here with a landscape scene, the figures still seem rather weightless. Nonetheless, Sassetta was clearly fascinated with new ideas about perspective constructions for architecture, as witnessed by the interior scene of St. Francis sleeping in his richly appointed room. The heavenly castle of the saint's vision floats over both scenes, linking the themes with a contrast of earthly and heavenly residences. Both were depicted using linear perspective, and Sassetta illuminated his scenes with a consistent source of light. Our final painting was also made outside of the Florentine tradition, but was just as sophisticated as Uccello's mix of fantasy and reality. Pisanello's vision of St. Eustace is one of only four panel paintings accepted as the authentic work of Pisanello. Another one of the four, the Virgin and Child with St. George and St. Anthony Abbott, his only signed panel, is also in the National Gallery. Antonio Pisano, whose dates were circa 1394 to 1455, was called Pisanello, the Little Pisan. But he actually grew up in Verona in northern Italy and worked in many locales around the Italian peninsula, including Rome and noble courts in Ferrara, Mantua, Milan, and Naples. He was a medalist, helping to revive that art from classical antiquity, as well as a panel and fresco painter. The vision of St. Eustace tells the story of a Roman soldier named Placidus who converted to Christianity after a day hunting when he saw Christ's crucifix between a stag's antlers and heard Christ's voice address him. It is another non-biblical story and derives from Jacobus de Veragine's Golden Legend, a 13th century compilation of saints' lives that included many colorful and apocryphal details. The Golden Legend served painters as a source book for imagery for several centuries, really even into the 17th century, and was the most frequently printed book during the first century of printed books in Europe. Now, in Pisanello's painting, the saint on horseback is dressed as a contemporary nobleman, not as a Roman soldier. The profile view of the saint recalls Pisanello's portrait medals of various Italian rulers being made right around the same time. Hunting was strictly reserved for those of noble blood in the Renaissance, and hunt scenes in a variety of artistic media were favorites at courts. Pisanello's painting resembles to some degree hunt tapestries of the late medieval and early Renaissance periods, especially in the flat rendering of space which moves up on the panel rather than seeming to recede into the distance. Again, this is a choice of Pisanello's. It's not that he didn't know better. He certainly could have shown it more with you know, a convincing perspective, but I think he wants to imitate that sense of a tapestry. An abundance of different animal and bird species appears through the work, typically seen in profile views as well. Several different kinds of hunting dogs are included, which suggests that Pisanello understood the different functions each dog would perform while hunting. The animals and birds seem vivacious and individualized on the whole. More drawings by Pisanello exist than from any other contemporary Italian artist, and many of these drawings are of animals clearly drawn from life. However, other animal and bird drawings by the artist appear to be copies of pre-existing images of natural life, the kind of drawings artists collected in so-called pattern books. These were source books of motifs, both of animals and depictions of humans, kept in artist workshops for use by both the master and his pupils. They provided stock images to populate paintings. You could put people in the background that weren't as important you would draw out of the pattern books. Some of the Pisanello animal drawings do seem to have been used for the St. Eustace panel, but that does not mean they were specifically made in preparation for it. The same drawing could be used in a number of paintings in different contexts. Pisanello's drawings were often made with several media, such as pen and ink and black chalk, or pen and watercolor on paper. Paper was a relatively expensive support until the mid-15th century, 
and thus we do not have many Italian drawings before this date. This does not mean that artists did not draw, however. What they actually used were erasable tablets that could be used over and over again, or for particularly important drawings, they would actually use parchment, prepared animal skin. We've seen in this lecture a number of different approaches to naturalism, whether it be showing uh, animals that seem to have been studied from nature, forms in space, the use of linear perspective. All of these characterize Italian art of the 15th century and suggest a real break from the past. It would be reasonable at this point then to turn to another part of Europe and to see the effect of naturalism there. And in the next lecture, we will turn to northern paintings, Netherlandish paintings in the National Gallery.